Well, if you have your Bibles with you or the Bible on the phone or look at the screen, we're going to uh, be doing our Bible reading. Um, It's a reading that's often used on the day of Pentecost. It contains two things, the power of the Holy Spirit, birthing the church, but it also contains the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to focus on the ascension today. And uh, it's from Acts chapter 1, 1 to 12. Here we go. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Hallelujah. I added that. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, whilst he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Amen. Well, I have to say, church, it's good to be here and to see so many of you here and to all of you who are online as we come uh, really in so many ways in this, in this season to bring our story uh, to conclusion today. Um, and I wanted to do this just to put everything that we've been doing in the past few weeks into a, its full and complete context. And what a blessed Passover season we have had. And I like to call it the Passover season. For those who were here for the teaching on Wednesday evening, I did explain a little bit about how we've Christianized Easter and how glad I am that the dates that we have, Resurrection Sunday, are all linked to the Passover of Israel. And that's how we've done our celebration this year. We have actually tried to be as biblical as we can, and we've gone through our Passover season. And of course, it was the last week of Jesus' life. It occurred significantly by design before the world was even founded. God had the plan that this was the time that Jesus' last week would be in a very significant Passover season. And of course, it's the Jewish Pascal full moon that ushered in spring. And this year, when we celebrated our Passover meal and we were leaving to go home, Helena said, look at that moon. It was a full moon, a glorious moon. And of course, the Jewish calendar runs by the moon and all the pagan stuff is running by the S-U-N. And we as Christians, we run by the moon, but everything that, that, that we do is according to the S-O-N, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And it was on the night of the Passover, and it's significant that we have our um, communion meal today. It was on the night of Passover that Jesus was betrayed. He was tried the next day. He was crucified. He was dead and buried. 
and on the third day he rose from the grave victorious. Again, if you were here on Wednesday, you would have heard me say that Jesus didn't die on Friday. It's impossible. He gave the sign of Jonah that he would be three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. And I've done teaching on that in the past. And it's amazing this last week how Jesus fulfilled so many things in that week. There were two special Passovers. There were things going on. And Jesus fulfilled all the timings of the Gentiles under the Roman calendar or the Roman clock. And he fulfilled everything under the Jewish clock. The evening and the morning were the first day. It is muy complicado that last week. So much was happening. But they said to Jesus, didn't they? Give us a sign. Show us who you are. And he said, you wicked and adulterous generation you will only get the sign of Jonah as Jonah was in the belly of the whale so the son of man had been the belly of the earth for three days and three nights and I'm happy to say that this year we fulfilled everything with the right timing and resurrection Sunday was the right time it was perfect we had on Wednesday night we had our Passover the night he was betrayed and then on Sunday we got resurrection Uh, it was a great season that we have been in And of course, the key events of this season are as follows. You're going to get the summary of the whole thing and the pinnacle of the ending. Jesus told his disciples that the Son of Man would suffer, that he would have to die going and lifted high on a cross. And they were asking Jesus the question, or Jesus asked them the question, Who do you say I am? And you'll remember that God revealed to Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it was six days after this exchange, six days after this exchange, that Jesus is transfigured. That's a picture of the transfiguration on Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in Israel. And uh, if you want to learn much more about that, go on our website and, and see the teaching on the transfiguration. And transfiguration means a changed state from one into something else. It's very simple. And Matthew 17, 2 says, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And uh, Jesus on Mount Hermon, he he is high and he is lifted up and, and Moses and Elijah are there with him, each representing the law and the prophets. And they're seen with Jesus by three of the disciples. Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. Every dot and jittle and every aspect of the law, Jesus fulfilled perfectly in his holiness as the God man. Jesus is high lifted up and Jesus is higher than the law and Jesus is, is, is greater than all the Old Testament prophets. And you'll remember in the story of the transfiguration, there's a glory cloud. He's surrounded in a, in, in a cloud and, and God speaks and the glory cloud is, is the Shekinah glory of God. And God speaks, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. You see, Jesus is the prophet of God. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. And Jesus' transfiguration is the visible declaration to the question that Jesus asked his disciples. And it's only one question that Jesus asks the world today. Who do you say I am? And the the transfiguration actually puts Jesus higher than all things. And there's this glimpse of the glory of God in Christ. And of course, the transfiguration is happening before his crucifixion. But it is showing that amazing change is coming. The promised Messiah is here and he's going to save his people through death and resurrection. And the next significant event in our story, how I'm piecing it together for you today as a summary, is Palm Sunday. Jesus enters Jerusalem. 
They hail him as king and they give him a king's welcome. They make a royal roadway by laying palm leaves and their cloaks, welcoming their king. Hosanna or Hoshanna in the highest. Save us, Jesus. That's the cry of the people's heart. But it did not last long, did it? How fickle humanity is. How fickle. And how we misunderstand what is happening before us. It didn't last long. Hosanna, Hosanna to crucify him, crucify him. And the next event in our story is indeed the Passover in that final week. Celebrating the Passover, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He takes the role of a servant, the humblest and the filthiest job reserved for the lowest servant. Do you know, here in Spain, we buy open sandaled shoes, and I have to say, mine reek something awful. You know, I have to wash them and scrub them and put perfume on them because feet get smelly and sweaty. And uh, people's feet in the Holy Lands in Jesus' day was way worse than all of ours put together here today. And, uh, and Jesus humbled himself, and, and we know that he, he took off his robes, and, and we know how he washed his disciples' feet. And, and Peter says, you're not washing my feet. Whoa, they smell worse than anything in the whole world. It's probably what he was thinking. Actually, it wasn't. He was thinking, you are the master. You are the rabbi. You can't, you can't wash my feet. That's reserved for the, the lowest of the low. And of course, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, ha, then you're not mine. If I don't wash your feet, Peter, you are none of mine. And then glorious Peter, lovely Peter, enthusiastic Peter, he says, in that case, wash all of me from head to foot. Every part of me, wash it and wash it thoroughly and wash it well. And of course, that's coming from Peter again. He's sharing what Jesus' blood was going to do. Wash us to those who believe from all of our sin. Every nook and every any cranny, every small thing, every big thing. You know, God doesn't grade sin. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone needs a savior. And then, of course, it was in that Passover meal that Judas betrays Jesus. And Jesus knows. He knows the Son of Man will suffer. And in that encounter with Judas, even though Jesus knows, he gives Judas two or three opportunities to repent. He knew he wouldn't repent, but he gave him the opportunity to repent. He knew in the foreknowledge in his heart, he knew... And yet he still offered his grace, his mercy, his humility. Judas, don't do this. The worst thing's going to happen if you do. And Jesus gives everyone the opportunity to repent. And at the end of the meal, Jesus lifts up the bread, doesn't he? This is my body broken for you. And, and at the very end of the meal, he, he lifts up the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And then he endures all the trials. And then the next day, Jesus is high and lifted up. Not on Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in Israel in transfiguration glory, but Jesus is lifted high on a wooden cross. He's lifted up in humility to serve mankind. And he is the crimson worm from last week's sermon. Jesus is crucified. And with hurry, because this second Sabbath was coming, with hurry, with hurry, they have to bury him. No time for anointing, which is why Mary had broken the perfume and anointed Jesus for his burial before. And Jesus is buried for 
the correct amount of time, the sign of Jonah, for three days and for three nights, he is buried in the belly of the earth. And then, hallelujah, on the break of day, well, at the correct second, I believe, I reckon God is perfect in his precise timing. You know, in the right nanosecond, God's ways are perfect in every single way. And at the exact time, after three days and three nights, is fulfilled on the Sunday, the first day of the Jewish week, the tomb is empty. He is risen, he is risen, he is risen. Jesus is alive. I was going to sing that for you, but I will spare you. Do you know, I, um, you know, there's a lot of pollen out there at the moment, a lot of hay fever if you're suffering. And uh, I was there on the front row and I had to blow my nose and all of a sudden I could hear clearly. And, and I thought, wow, what are all those lovely harmonies around me? And it was all of you singing wonderfully together in our worship time. But Jesus the grave is empty, the stone is rolled away. He is not here. Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead, says the angels. He is risen, he is alive. And so now we come in the time we have left to us. Now we come to the part of the story um, which is often left out within uh, our season at this time. So we often end our story, don't we, on Resurrection Sunday. We forget the crowning glory to the whole story that brings it nicely to completion. And that is the ascension of Jesus lifted up to where he's supposed to be. Not high and lifted up on Mount Hermon in transfiguration, but he is lifted to the right hand side of God in heaven. And the word ascension, a very simple word, it simply means movement upwards, movement upwards. So if you fly in a plane, many of our swallows have come back, it's great seeing people. You were lifted upwards in that plane, you ascended into the first heaven, and you landed uh, at an airport. The word ascension means movement upwards, and indeed, when you read the Bible, the temple, Jerusalem is on a high, well, seven hills. It's on a hilly location. And the people of God would ascend. They would lift themselves up the hill, up the mountain, to go to the temple to worship God. And Jesus' ascension simply means that Jesus is lifted up into heaven. And we read, didn't we, that the disciples watched. They saw Jesus ascending. And did you notice that the same glory cloud, the Shekinah glory of God, was there with Jesus as the cloud comes upon him and they see him lifted up in the cloud into glory. And here again is resounding Jesus' divinity. He is God Almighty going home. Amen. And Jesus is then lifted up into heaven and where is Jesus now? Well, the Bible tells us he's lifted into heaven and he sat down and he is seated at the right hand of God, which is the position of authority. And, uh, do you know, I quite like sitting down. I sit at the left-hand side of Helena, actually. Uh, and, and, and I like to put... I like to put my feet on, on, on a table, well we had a table with a little shelf and I would put my feet on the shelf and I'd sit back, very comfortable. And Jesus has got his feet on his enemies which are a footstool and they're there under his control and subjugation and Jesus is there in heaven and he's making his enemies a footstool and that's where Jesus is, the ascended risen Lord but he's doing something important. But the ascension took place 40 days after the resurrection. So this is not Ascension Sunday, if you are a good Anglican or you come from those traditions. But the ascension took place 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus appeared over those 40 days to his disciples and as Luke 
who wrote the book of Acts said, he did many amazing things. He did many things to prove who he was and that he'd risen from the dead, that he is alive. And the number 40 means something. The number 40 typically means a period of testing, of trial, and of judgment. And I don't know if you know your Bibles really well. I don't know if you're thinking through all the 40s in the Bible. In fact, there was a huge list. I thought, well, I can't read out that list. It's a big, huge list. And then I thought, well, I could read it, read it really fast, but, but I'll give you just a few. 40 means testing, trial, and judgment. It rained 40 days and 40 nights in the day of Noah. Thank you, Robert, for that sermon on Noah. Do you know there's always more to learn? I learned loads. But it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And the rain is the symbol of judgment on that world at that time. And of course, another significant moment, Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And that was their testing, it was their trial, and actually it was the judgment of God because they lacked the faith to take the promised land. Israel was supposed to be in the desert for three to six days traveling to the promised land, and then they were to go in and seize it. But they wavered and they wandered. Two said it's okay, 10 spies, was it 12 spies? 10 said no and two said yes. Do you know sometimes we mustn't listen to the majority. Sometimes listening to the majority will get us in a nice little pickle. And there's a lot of things that are happening in the world today that we should not be listening to. Do you know there is a significant place for us to be in a minority, to be a voice, because sometimes the minority is right. Hallelujah. So anyway, Israel wandered in the wilderness of 40 years. Moses, when he gave the Ten Commandments, he was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. He was high and lifted up. He was receiving uh, the first covenant of God. But why is the ascension of Jesus into heaven important? Why? I don't know if you've thought about the question. The ascension of Jesus into heaven marks the end of Jesus' bodily appearances on earth. It ended Jesus' earthly mission. It started with a miracle birth, his baptism, a picture he's going to take the sins of the world, fulfilling all the Old Testament prophecies in his death and resurrection. And his ascension marks the end of his physical earthly ministry. The ascension means that Jesus Christ has returned to his former residence. He's returned to the residence which was always designed for him, being God in eternity. And Jesus is glorified and lifted and exalted above all things. And you know, the ascension means that Christ's salvation work, listen, is fully complete. Jesus has done a complete job in the work of salvation, and he is accepted into heaven by the Father as the one who has fulfilled all things. This is my Son in whom I love, Listen to him. And Jesus is welcome. What a, I, I don't know if you can imagine it. You know, I, I love Revelation 5 when you, you've got all the angels worshiping, seeing Jesus and wow, who he is. And whew, it's incredible. That must have been an amazing welcome home to Jesus. Do you know there was that, that time when the angelic forces were watching because they marvel at this thing called salvation for human beings. And the angels are, are watching what's happening to the Christ, the one from heaven who they worship and adore on a cross. And they were ready. At one command, they would have come and smote everybody. 
wipe them out. But no, our sin held him there. And Jesus completed the work of salvation and his ascension proves it. He is fully accepted into heaven by the Father. Because Jesus is vindicated, he's innocent, he sits at the right hand of the Father, and that's the position of authority. Jesus has the power in his name. Because he is vindicated, he has the power in his name to vindicate believers from their sin. God has given everything to the Son. Everything to the Son, in whom he is well pleased. And the ascension means something else, which is a great encouragement for all of us. With our aches and our pains and some of us broken bones and hurting bits and pieces and the stuff that we go through in the suffering in this world because sin causes death and death has reigned since Adam. But the ascension means the first of resurrected humanity has entered heaven. Jesus is fully God and he is fully human. And the ascension of Christ means the first fruits, the, the, means the first resurrected humanity. Jesus has entered heaven. That means he's blazed the way for all of us as believers to follow him. What a great encouragement that is, particularly if we're suffering or we're ill in body, soul, and spirit at the moment. And so the ascension of Christ means, means not beggars with crumbs, but it means that we will be exalted with Jesus Christ. We will be high and lifted up with Jesus Christ. He has made a way for us. He is the first and we will follow him. And as Helena said last week, our corruptible flesh will put on incorruptibility. We will be changed and we will be different because flesh and blood like this cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So the ascension means we will have a body like Jesus. This flesh and his blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, but we will be transformed or changed, transfigured into the likeness of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is what salvation is all about. And as we read in our Bible reading, because Jesus has gone, because he was physically here, both in this form and his resurrected form, the ascension means that Holy Spirit would come. Jesus went up and Holy Spirit came down and is over the whole world. The Spirit of God proceeding from the Father and the Son, the third person of the Trinity, God from God, true God and true light. Holy Spirit is here over the whole world. And the job of Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin is to convict the world of sin and to point to Jesus as the Savior. There's only one Savior of the world. We can reserve that for Pentecost. And the ascension means something else. I don't know if you thought about it. Jesus' earthly ministry, the means of salvation is complete, but the ascension means that Jesus has begun his new ministry. Do you know there's going to be work for eternity? It's not going to be boring. You know, I, uh, I used to talk about what's heaven going to be like, particularly when I was a very good golfer and I was scoring under 120. And, uh, and, and I was thinking, wow, heaven's going to be great because every round of golf I play will be a score of 18. <laughs> because every ball I hit will go straight in. And then I thought, hang on a sec, eternity is a long time. How boring that's going to be. Heaven, believe me, is not going to be boring. There is work to be done. Heaven is going to be glorious. We will be excited and motivated every single day of eternity. And as a second goes to us, well, it could be a million years. That's eternity. 
And anyway, so the ascension means that Jesus has begun his new ministry of intercession, praying for the saints. Are you aware of that? I should have had a slide here. Apologies, I think my right hand went to sleep at that moment. Hebrews 7.25 says this. It talks, Hebrews is wonderful. It talks about Jesus as our high priest who has gone before us with a sacrifice that's acceptable to God. But Hebrews 7.25 says this. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Do you know you have a prayer partner? Every every born-again believer has a prayer partner. His name is Jesus. And Jesus is praying for you, over you, all of you, all the time, every second. That is my belief. He's the greatest multitasker. And he can do all things. And so Jesus has gone to heaven with a new ministry. And he is able to save us. Because actually, he knows us. We've accepted the washing of his blood, and he's praying for us to make it. And with Jesus as my prayer partner, who can fail? Amen? And also, the ascension means something else. That Jesus has begun his ministry as our advocate. Our advocate, our advogado. I think that might be Spanish for advocate. And the root meaning of the word advocate is lawyer. So you don't only have a prayer partner in heaven, Jesus Christ the Lord, you have a lawyer in heaven. And Jesus is the Christian's defense lawyer in heaven. 1 John 2, 1 says this, but if anybody does sin, We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Do you know there is a a day of judgment coming? And I want Jesus to be my advocate in heaven when I get there. I can't lose with Jesus as my lawyer. I can't lose because he says, you promised me, Father, to give me all that are mine. And I died for him, and he's washed in my blood. And the Father will say, I see him as I see you. Well done, good and faithful servant, my son. Hallelujah. And so when Jesus is our lawyer, this is a message to the whole world. You want to have Jesus as your lawyer. The verdict is assured. Innocent. Hallelujah. Innocent. We will be declared innocent. And finally, the the amazing uh, thing about the ascension means that Christ will come back. Excuse me. I love my sister. Yay. From the front row. I wasn't looking, but I know her voice. From our reading, the angels said, we're closing. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? How long would they have looked? Where are you? Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Amen? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And now, blessed assurance, Jesus will return for me. And he will return for you. And Jesus will return in the glory cloud of God, the Shekinah glory. Jesus came as a servant wrapped in human flesh. But Jesus will return in the full glory of God. Hallelujah. And verse 12 goes on to tell us the place that Jesus will return to. Verse 12 says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. Such a significant hill in Israel. A Sabbath day walk from the city. Jesus went from the Mount of Olives and he will return to the Mount of Olives. In the end times there will be a great war as all the nations of the earth surround Israel. The war is aimed at Israel, but the mighty one of Israel. Jesus Christ the Lord 
will prevail. And the ascension took place on Mount of Olives and Jesus will return to the Mount of Olives in the same way. And when he comes to the Mount of Olives, it will split in two. Zechariah 14 says this, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. And do you know, I've told you this before, but now you can see it on a map. There is a fault line directly and exactly in the right direction of the Mount of Olives, in the right direction. This will split north and south, creating a huge valley. I believe that God has put this fault line for this very purpose, for Christ's return. And when Jesus comes, it will shift and create a great valley as prophesied in Scripture. In fact, they were building a hotel on the Mount of Olives. It's uh, known as the uh, Seven Arches Hotel. And they discovered the ground fault line and they had to shift it. There'll be nothing in the way of Jesus' return. There can be nothing built there. They had to shift it onto stable ground. To conclude, the ascension of Jesus Christ in heaven, into heaven, is essential for us to know and not to forget. The event completes our whole Passover story in this season. Jesus is our Paschal Lamb, the Lamb that was slain, and Jesus is our lawyer, our advocate in heaven, the risen and ascended Christ. He is seated at the right hand of the Father in power and authority. And the ascension is important because it also contains the very last words that Jesus spoke on earth. I don't know if you picked that up, but here it is. The disciples were marveling at the resurrection and, and Jesus' appearances and, and they were wondering about the kingdom of God coming. And so, verse 6, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Clearly, that hasn't happened yet. It's a future event. And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The last words of Jesus. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Do you know, the kingdom of God is here in the church. But the fullness of the kingdom is not yet. It is to come, and Jesus is coming back to set it up. We don't know the times or the dates, but I tell you, Jesus does. He talks to his Father. He is God from God with all knowledge in heaven. He knows the dates. And Jesus tells us that we will have power in the Holy Spirit and he commands us to be his witnesses to the end of the earth. And these are the last words of Jesus. And I hope we take them seriously at Salt Church. It is our mission to work while we wait, to work while we wait for Jesus' return, to move in the power of Holy Spirit and above all, to be witnesses to Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done, that salvation is in him alone, to give our testimony as a Christian to all, wherever we are, and to whoever we meet, when the opportunity presents. Amen. Let us pray. Master. You are the God who completes all things. And Father, we thank you that you have completed and the ascension is the proof of all these things. And Lord, we just wait and we work and we watch and we wait and we work until your return. In Jesus' name, amen.